On this episode of DLN Extend, we discuss, do Linux users really care about privacy? This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 66 of DLN Extend. DLN Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the DLN community, from places like the DLN Discourse Forums, Telegram Group, Discourse Server, and more. We also take topics from other shows around the network and give our takes. With me today are my two co-hosts, Wendy, the Natasha Romanoff of photography, avenging the crimes of photographic malpractice, and Matt, the Doctor Strange of gaming on the DLN network. How are you guys? Well, you solved the curiosity is what you were going to call us. All of that hype, it paid off. That was absolutely hilarious. (laughs) That was great. Not bad, by the way. (laughs) Thanks, Matt. Not bad is like quite the praise. That's almost like me giving props to Michael. (laughs) Yes. Yes, exactly. If you ever gave me actual praise, I would think you're like sick and probably on the verge of death. So, I mean, I hope I never hear that coming out of your mouth. Nate, I probably would be. (laughs) Oh, Nate, you've been great. I'm like, what? Are you okay? Are you dying? So, Matt, I understand you're going to leave your computer for a while and go do things? Yeah, I'm going to go see what this whole like giant orange ball thing is in the sky. I think it's called the sun. Oh. Let's just say after doing what I do for work, dealing with people after a while just becomes not a real big thing I want to do. So I am literally packing up a pack and I'm just going to go out in the middle of the woods for about about five days. Solo or are you going to go like with some friends? Do you have friends, Matt? I'm curious to know, do you actually have friends? (laughs) Do I have physical, actual, real life, in-person friends? Not just e-friends. Yes, I do. Really? But none of them enjoy camping. Well, paint me green and call me Gumby. I'll paint you green and call you Open Sousa. Or Kiko. Yeah, okay. That works with me too. That works too. Yep. (laughs) It's one of those, I just want to get away. I'm kind of over dealing with... The intricacies of human interaction for a few days. I'm packing up a pack and I'm just hitting part of the Appalachian Trail for five days and just being left alone and out in the middle of nowhere. That sounds absolutely awesome. I totally get that. Sometimes it's needed just for like clearing your head, get away from the things. Yeah, definitely. And for me, it's one of those, I want to get back to some of the stuff that I used to do a little more than life has allowed me to. And that does mean stepping away from the job a little bit more, a little bit less time in front of the computer screen or in your case, they like a little bit less time in the super cubicle. Right. Even though your super cubicle is dismantled. Still being dismantled, but yeah. But you get the idea. Wendy, you would appreciate this because it's one of those, how light can I go for five days? (laughs) Yeah, just what you need, especially if you're backpacking in. Mm -hmm. Every time we go camping, there's usually like an absolute ton of stuff especially with all six of us, it is nothing light. And I have to say, there's never a bad time to go. I went camping with my third child. She's an August baby until the midwife is like, please don't go to the mountains anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We've been in the like mid to high nineties with like crappy humidity. So I'm hoping this time off that I got coming up, the weather's a little bit more friendly, agreeable. <laughs> yeah. But if not, well, it is what it is. Yep. Part of the whole nature thing. Well, so. my experience has been anytime there's camping involved, it's going to rain and then get really hot right after. It's the maximum amount of misery you can possibly have. Every time. Doesn't matter what the weather report says coming up. It's always going to be like that. Oh, not around here. Rain is a rarity unless it's Memorial day weekend and then it typically rains all weekend though last time we went here a couple weekends ago it was really hot and we live in a desert and we're going through one of those drought times in the desert we're like please rain please rain because we heard some thunder off in the distance and it rained and cooled everything down and it was super nice so our rainstorm made things lovely nature and all that stuff I want to get back to more fun stuff that I used to do and being out and enjoying the world as opposed to just seeing it through a computer screen. Oh, for sure. I get it. Yes. Sounds good. There's certain things that while I'm chatting about trying to get out in the world, Wendy, there's something about a chat for you. Yes. We had the extended DLN chat, which that still, like you said, Nate, is interesting to call it. But so there was that extended chat on July 11th. And I had a great time chatting with everybody. I normally don't get to interact with the community as much as I'd like to, especially on those different live chats and that kind of thing. And I was on there for quite a few hours after the show. During that conversation, I was talking to Bill and Neil about 
all kinds of Linux education stuff. And we got to talking about the laptops that I'm going to be using for class this fall and what was on them. And of course, Neil would have been much happier to know that it was Fedora or OpenSUSE. And right now they're Kubuntu. And some of that is issues with getting anything to boot on these laptops. They're kind of a funky piece of hardware. And so in order to get them to work properly, Bill did some stuff, I believe he said with the bootloader, to get them to go. And then I believe there was something else that he was having issues with when it came to the pen on them working. I can't remember what these laptops are called. I'll have to drop a link in the show notes as to what they are. But they have a pen that comes with them so you can write directly on the screen. They're a really neat little laptop. That sparked a conversation between the two of like, well, we need to figure out how to get OpenSUSE working out of the box on these without having to do any kind of funky side loading or editing stuff. So there's a project now between those two to make sure that it works out of the box. And in that conversation, Neil mentioned the fact that for education services and different kind of things, OpenSUSE gives for school projects or nonprofit things, the ability to use all of the resources for OpenSUSE, even the customer support for free, which is really, really cool. It's an amazing thing that that project does. And so right now they're all running Kubuntu, but before school starts, they might all be running OpenSUSE. I looked into that program just after we talked because I didn't hear of it until Neil brought it up. They have like training materials, they have curriculum they'll offer you. They have other administrative production workloads and so forth. Development resources, which probably is outside your scope. But yeah, they have all kinds of things. And I just started digging into it because of Neil. And there's really a lot more to dig into on that. I think it'd be really neat because if you use OpenSUSE, I guess you have access to the SUSE program benefits. It'd be interesting to see what you're able to get from that. I'll probably plagiarize or rather fork your project and do something (laughs) similar over here. Yeah, because I know you're wanting to get something started for your co-op. It's probably not going to be this year. You've got some things to deal with to get there. I will be the test case. Yep. And Bill and Neil will help me get it going with SUSE. And then it'll be ready for you when you're ready to do it. You'll be the proof of concept in the Destination Linux Network. Yes, exactly. That's exciting. I'm excited to see what you do with it and to see how I can do something similar in the future. Yes, absolutely. He told me that OpenCL should work on OpenSUSE out of the box. So I did install Leap and try to make that work. And with the Mesa OpenCL, it still will not And when I mean it, Darktable still will not use the OpenCL protocol, so I don't know. I need to talk to him about that. We need to work it out and figure out how to get that fixed too. So my main right now is still Manjaro because I can get the AMD GPU Pro drivers that pull that part out so I can use mainly the Mesa drivers but have that little bit of proprietary thrown in so the OpenCL will work. Neil and I will be talking as this goes on. He'll help with his resources, get it figured out. Know who can help figure it out. Yeah, for sure. CAD seems to be a big thing for you between work that you've done and stuff that you like to do at home. Is there an update for the CAD that you use? Yeah, there is an update. Quite a while ago, I started playing with it and then just kind of been playing a little bit at a time. But an application called LeoCAD, there's been some updates this year. And version 2106 has some really neat little updates. Since I use this from time to time, these kids use it quite a bit. I try and stay on top of it. The big thing that's really excited about LeoCAD as of late, when I first started using it, you'd install the application and then you'd have to like download the parts packs. I mean, back up here. It's a Lego CAD software. And so you build Lego models, whatever, on the computer or Lego ideas on the computer. The kids use that. My oldest especially likes to play with it. When I first started using it, it was kind of a pain to get set up because you had to install parts packs that defines all the different little bits and pieces. It just was kind of a finicky process, it seemed like. Didn't always work quite right or I had problems with it. But now there's a flat pack and a snap. So it's really easy. You just flat pack or snap it in and you're good to go. They've done a lot of like UI improvement with it. There's a nice preview pane for any like sub models that you're working on that you want to incorporate into like a master model. There's improved BrickLink XML export. So like if the kids want to buy the part, well, I should say the kids want to, the kids always want their dad to buy something for them. But if we want to buy the parts to make it happen, we can actually export the parts list in XML. So it's really easy to upload that to BrickLink and then you can make a special custom order and modify it, whatever, and, and delete parts if you already have them. Oh, nice. What I think is neat is there are model measurements are in the properties dialog box now. So it actually will tell you how big it is in centimeters and inches. And most importantly, in LDU or Lego dimensional units, which I think is absolutely great. Funny thing is when I was at my previous employer, 
I was thinking of like, instead of using millimeters, I was going to convert it all to the Lego <laughs> dimensional units just to see if I'd get in trouble for that. I never actually did it. Now I have regrets that I never did that. I think that would have been funny. And little visual improvements too, like to actually show the logo on top of the studs for the parts now in the CAD model. It just adds some authenticity. You can turn that on or off. That does obviously have a bit of a taxation on your performance if you have a slower, older system. Anyway, so it's just a lot of little things, little improvements. The big thing too is like if you go to drag a part onto the model from the parts list, it doesn't, you know, send it up into like nowhere land up really high or off the part. So it actually, it's, it's a lot better. The automatic placement is way better now than it was. Little things like that. And there's still room for improvement on the application, of course. Uh, you don't get that clicking sensation when you put it together in the CAD. And also you can't step on it and feel the pain, which actually that might be the good thing about it. Yes, the clicking sensation is sad, but not stepping on it is a big bonus. Yeah, that's that's a big thing. So it's just a nice tool for my kids to learn CAD and also for them to come up with ideas and creations and play with stuff on their computers rather than just play games. It's also a great way to teach the idea of mechanical design principles. You know, you have master assemblies and sub assemblies that all come together to make a product. And then also you can create directions off of it too. And it's a really neat application. I don't know why more people don't play with it. Maybe because the, the real thing is probably better, but a great planning tool. I know you've talked about it before, and it's one I've been meaning to uh -huh. install and haven't installed yet. What are the minimum requirements to run something like this? Whatever it is, you probably have it. I don't know what the actual minimum requirements are. It's more of a, you'll have a better experience with a better GPU you have. My fourth generation Intel iCore 7 system that I use, it has no problem. Even my kid's third generation machine that he has, laptop, with the integrated GPU in it, has no problem running it. Even on an old netbook with an Atom processor, it doesn't have a problem running it. It's not resource intensive at all. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure on the numbers, but it is a Qt-based application. There is that if you don't like Qt, but I know you do, so. Yes, I do. That's not a problem. So I just did a search for LeoCAD, and the second thing that popped up on the list was from cubiclenate.com. LeoCAD on OpenSUSE. <laughs> Boom. Oh, look at that. Why am I not shocked nor surprised by that? Oh, it even switched to a dark color theme by default as of like late last year. So, I mean... That is awesome. That's not really that important. A lot, of, a lot of things are really improving the UI. That is a lie, Nate. UI improvements are good to have. It is. But I'm just saying that's a little thing. That matters a lot. I mean, yeah, for me, sure. I do not like a, a light interface at all. Yeah, switch to dark color thing by default. That was put in on the December 1st, 2020 update. I'm looking at the list on LeoCAD. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new Managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable, high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database. Simply offload your MongoDB administration to DigitalOcean and let them handle the provisioning, managing, scaling, updates, backups, and security for your clusters. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB Inc. And together, they have ensured that you will get access to all the latest releases of MongoDB document database as they become available. As a listener of DLN Extend podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo. Again, go to do.co slash DLN dash M-O-N-G-O and get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new Manage Mongo DB. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. So unlike LeoCAD, where you don't actually step on the bricks and it hurts you, this is a great discussion we can step on and possibly hurt somebody. Do Linux users really care about privacy or is it just all lip service? So Matt, since you decided this is the topic to go with, I want to throw you under the bus first. You all agreed to this topic. I don't even want to hear that. I was the one that said I decided. <laughs> I gave two other options of topics, but... And I gave this one <laughs> and you said, sure. Yeah, because, you know, I'm pretty amiable. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about whatever you want. I'm sure this won't offend anybody. Ironically, it's a complicated question with nuance. It was a shocking surprise there, huh? Everything has nuance. It's just, can you have nuance on the internet is the real question. No, because everyone on the internet, especially when it comes to Linux community, my way is the right way and anybody else is the wrong way. Rhetorically speaking, it's kind of ironic. I think they care about privacy. I think the problem is, is the way they tend to go about it. You have very outspoken people about privacy and privacy does matter. The problem is I think some people don't live in the realm of reality when it comes to when they look at privacy as what it is because you can have the idealized 
well, we don't want to send anything anywhere, et cetera. If you connect to the internet, you're going to be sending some type of information to someone. That's kind of the reality of it. Open up a browser, go to a website, go to insert service here, email providers, gaming services. All this stuff is data that you're going to be sending. You can get into the weeds about should your local system be sending data that you don't want to. That's a different story. We're talking about generic privacy. Do they care? Yes. It's just, I think there's a lot more lip service than people want to. So for me as a Linux user, I'm more than just a Linux user. I'm also a vintage tech user. I would say maybe a poor excuse for a gamer as well. Do I as a Linux user, how much do I care about privacy? I think it really depends. When I use an application, I expect there's a certain social contract I have like with open source applications where I know that I'm sending some information to developers to help them make a better product. And I opt into that 99% of the time. Actually, I don't even know a time that I did not opt into it recently. At the same time, when I go on to, let's say, social media service, Services where I realize that I am the product, I consider those things to have no respecting to my privacy whatsoever. So I just assume everything that I put on Twitter or even Mastodon or LinkedIn, I just assume everything I put on there, I would put on a billboard in the front of my house. This is what I said. That's basically, I just assume that. I'm very careful at what I say. When I use, let's say, like a e-commerce site, whatever it may be, I try not to use that big popular one that everybody uses. I expect a little more privacy there as far as I don't expect them to tell the world what I ordered and what my credit card number is and so forth. So I expect some privacy there. When it comes to like a browser, I actually get very, very fickle when it comes to like my browser life. I don't use Chrome. I haven't used Chrome actually, unless something just doesn't work on Firefox or Chromium, I haven't reserve, but I don't use it because I just don't trust the browser. I feel like it's a compromised browser. There's where I think I'm a little more privacy conscientious because there's a lack of trust that I have. I don't use it on my phone even. It really depends on what part of privacy, like how much I care, I guess. I ratchet up my care depending on what it is that I'm doing, if that makes any sense. No, that absolutely does make sense. When it comes to browsing, I also do my best to avoid anything chrome even chromium it's only used like you said if there's something i need absolutely does not work in firefox and that does come up sometimes actually i've been using ghostry browser most of the time anymore and really been liking it so of course that is based on firefox and it is set to have some maybe additional privacy stuff. Even in my Firefox, I still have Ghostry running as one of the add-ons for it. And mainly it's because of all these trackers that are absolutely everywhere on the internet. I really don't think that every single website needs to know where I go after I leave their website. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's also part of the reason why I have mail fence for my main personal email instead of having a Google account. And we've talked about that on a past episode. I do not want my email account advertising to me. I do not want my email gathering data about me, which then they can use to sell me stuff. So those are two things that I definitely keep on my day-to-day internet computer usage that is a little bit more on the privacy-focused side. This is where devices I could do better. So I am running an Android device right now. This particular one, I haven't been able to root and ROM it. And if it is, and most of mine usually are, have a custom ROM on it, I definitely feel more comfortable because typically there still is some Google stuff on there, but I'm far more in control as to what Google stuff is allowed in. And devices can be really finicky in that spot. So it's not even just phones, but smartwatches. And now even the devices that people have all over their house, and I don't have any, I don't have an Alexa, I do not have a Google pod thing, whatever. I refuse to have those in my house. If I want to invite a little spy to sit on my counter and listen to me all the time, then I would do that. And I have absolutely no desire to. Unless we get something from the open source community where I know a better idea of where that data is going and what it's collecting and if it's local or not, we will not have any of those assistants in the house, period. I refuse to have one. I agree with you that those are scary items, the Alexa. I do actually have one. (gasps) Shock. Uh, But mostly it's kept off. So because I'm a lonely single man, I do occasionally turn it on and have conversations with Alexa in my kitchen while I'm doing stuff. (laughs) That's only like for entertainment purposes, like when I'm a sad, lonely uh, single dude. And you need a conversation while you're making dinner that isn't with the kids, right? Right. Exactly. And is it crazy? Yeah, probably. Probably less crazy than talking to myself. 
it can be fun. And I'll always ask Alexa, oops, I shouldn't have said that. I'll always ask that device if it's spying on me. It'll say something <laughs> funny or it'll say no, our privacy policy, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, I don't believe you. And then doesn't know how to respond to that. So, right. But I just want them to get those metrics in there that I think that you're spying on me. I just want them to hear that, that lack of trust. Don't worry. They'll save your recording for you. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Because of the, the reality of how information and a lot of the times you are the product now, you know, Google, Amazon's weird in that regard because you're the product, but they push you to buy stuff. So therefore you're not the product because you're not buying physical products, but they're pushing customized product. They're reverse Google essentially. No, you're still the product. I have had Fire tablets in the past that have a Fire OS on there and it is all about how much crap can they sell you that you don't actually need. That's what I mean. That they're about selling you like physical things, whereas Google's selling you something for free. Google's more like, here are some other physical things that you can buy. They're not from <laughs> us, but here are all these ads because we heard you say this one thing while having a conversation yeah. with your friends and now it's populated in your search. Way to go. Yeah, your search, your YouTube, your take your pick. And that's great. And now you can buy that Jeep you always wanted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we are looking for a Jeep, but it's an old Jeep. Can Google help me with that? Yeah, I know. Alexa told me. I figured Google advertised it for you. It's up to you to control it as much as you can. Because the reality is, is like if you're looking for total anonymity or that kind of web browsing experience, very hard and few and far between, especially if you're going to be looking at using a lot of these you know, social services and whatever. As far as Google, Amazon, if you want to go Facebook and Twitter and that route too. It's one of those yeah. things where you're going to give up something of your privacy. It's up to you to control it as much as you can. That's what I try to do. So a lot of my machines now, especially on my Linux machines, I run Fire Dragon based off LibreWolf, a privatized version of Firefox. I guess is the best way to describe that. It makes sense. It has Canvas Blocker installed by default, New Block Origin. It has like Dark Reader and no script and that kind of stuff. You do what you can with the tools that you have available to limit or say, okay, this is what I'm willing to give you. That's really the best we can do. So like on my Android phone, I use Orba and Tor Browser or Orfox or whatever they're calling it now as much as I possibly can because they don't need to know every bit of thing that I'm doing on my phone. And yes, I will direct my cellular data as much as I can through a VPN and all the other. So I'll use every bit of privacy stuff that you can. But at the end of the day, even VPNs, you're trusting that they're not going to sell you up the river to insert ad company here or whatever. And that's where if you're going to go a VPN route, you need to be looking at a company that's been around for a while and actually see have they had breaches because there are some VPN companies out there that have actually had data leaked. So that means they are keeping stuff. You really are not <coughs> Nor private. VPN. <coughs> Not that I would ever name names. Not to mention anything. So making sure you're using a VPN service that is actually really high quality makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Not all VPNs are created equal. No, they're not. Privacy really boils down to degree of trust, especially when it comes to the exchange of data, be it and bits and boops in like Nate would potentially like to say, as far as the information we're sending across the internet and that we're trusting that these people are doing this with the data that they say they're going to. I find it a little hypocritical sometimes when you get the privacy diehards who will be the, one of the first ones to fire up Chrome and log into a Google account. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I am totally fine with understanding that as much as we might not like a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook, for some people, even for content creators, there are diehards that are privacy and FSF types that use YouTube. Well, guess what? You're using a Google product. That's the reality. You'll get these guys, they'll talk about, oh, well, go use Odyssey or Library. And I love both same platform, but you know what I mean. They'll still post to YouTube because they're like, oh, well, we're trying to reach a bigger audience. Well, then you're compromising what you're kind of believing in my eyes. Example, I'm not a fan of Twitter generically. Out of all the social platforms that are in that sphere, it's still a dumpster fire, but it's like the smaller of the dumpster fires, if that makes yeah. sense. As far as like how badly it's going to upsell you on everything. I can deal with the targeted ads. I can deal with that stuff because that's stuff that I'm inputting into Twitter. And that's generically from what I've seen anyway. 
how they decide to what promoted tweets and that kind of stuff you see. I'm fine with that. That's more of a willing exchange of information. Something like if I use Google and or I have a conversation with somebody and something that I said 10 minutes ago pops up on an ad makes me a little concerned. For my own personal sanity, I actually used a rule in uBlock Origin in Firefox to block the trending section on Twitter. Mm -hmm. It's not really a privacy thing so much as it is an aggravation thing, distraction. (laughs) Burning dumpster fire. I realize there's just so much garbage on Twitter. It's not good for your soul to just subject yourself to it. For my own mental health, I've decided that I would basically limit Twitter to only having my home feed, which is only people that I'm willing to see what they have to say on a regular basis. And there's some people that I think are on the edge of that, whether or not I can tolerate them or not. As long as I think they're good people, I find have a fine experience on Twitter. It's mostly nerdy things, you know, vintage tech, not even so much gaming. People think Linux people are visceral. The gaming people are extremely visceral with their comments and criticisms. Speaking as the resident gamer, you're not raw. (laughs) Gamers can be brutal when it comes to exactly how they feel. What I will say is if you add a Linux user and they're a gamer on top of it, be expecting double brutal. Yeah, that's why I follow you. Oh, (laughs) I got that one because you're not wrong. Wow. So did you just say that Matt was double brutal? Yes, he can be. (laughs) But, you know, he's an honest broker. I'll give him that. He's an honest broker. I'm only mean to you, Nate. So it's okay. And Michael. So I know that you had set up a pie hole, Nate. How is that still working? Are you still seeing lots of blocks? Is that something that you think privacy wise for... A majority of the community would be a good thing to get set up. I think so. I think going with a pie hole for your home, it's easy to set up. It's nothing to maintain. It takes care of itself. I have not had any issues of any problems as a result of it. I thought maybe I did, but it wasn't the cause of the problem that I was having. Now, the question is, how much privacy do I think I'm actually getting from it? I'm not 100% sure. I see how much is being blocked, but is that enough? I think it's enough for me right now. And until I identify another like serious problem, I can add to those rules. I just have the basic set of rules right now. And I would love to actually hear some feedback from everyone in the community if they think that the basic set of rules is not enough. I don't want to degrade on the performance of things. It's more to enhance the performance of the network. I find that when I have Pi Hole on, it's not so much I get any faster through rates, but more so like when I go and my computer makes a request for a website or whatever, that time of getting to that site is much quicker when I have Pi Hole activated versus not. So for me, it's getting rid of all that extra unnecessary cruft that I see as detracting from my internet usage experience. And especially if you have like dodgy or questionable internet, I would say it should actually be a requirement Maybe for you, because I know that you're out there in the hinterlands up in the high desert. I don't know what your internet service provider is, but that might actually improve your overall performance. We have a mom and pop service provider, so they're pretty small. And for the most part, they do all right. It's a line of sight to a tower is how our internet works. And it can really easily be bogged down. I know at one time, part of our internet problems was it had switched us to a different tower. That tower had such a heavy load on it and the distance increased that we were getting like almost nothing for internet, frequent drops. My ping times were absolutely outrageous, like in the 300 millisecond range. Just crazy. One could almost say, especially where you live, everyone had something like a pie hole on their network. That would improve everybody's network experience because you're not getting all these additional requests that are slowing your internet and collectively other people's internet down. So really installing something like a pie hole on your network, especially where you are, would be a service to everybody. Find other people using that service too. Maybe talk to your provider saying, hey, this will improve performance. Here are the numbers of what it'll do to reduce the number of pings and requests. You know, if it's reducing it by just say 8,000 or whatever in my house and you have 10 customers, how much less traffic is going through the network here if everyone had a pie hole? Yeah. That's just a thought. Now, do you think that there's an issue with privacy and gaming? Do you see like there's any kind of intrusive privacy practices by any of the, let's say Steam. Do you think Steam is intrusive in your game experience? I don't think so personally. Like my problem is a lot of it agreeing with these EULAs or these terms of service or you know, whatever licensing format they're deciding to use. I go into a thing like Steam expecting certain data to be given when the Steam survey shows up and I kind of get an idea of what they're looking for. I'm not all that concerned. You have things like CPU types and GPU types and OS type and GPU and like hardware information, which is not anything I'm not expecting. It gets a little more dicey when you start adding on, I use the term proprietary software in kind of a more overarching nature, but anytime you're adding something somebody in the community can't verify, you're potentially giving up your privacy. You don't know what potential a game might have in the background because you're trusting the code at that point. 
to me, it's not that big of a deal because it's more of an entertainment medium. Some people, video games, they make a living. I'm not going to lie. For me, I don't see it as me giving up anything that I wouldn't normally do when I pop open a web browser and type in anything that a web page doesn't already essentially request anyway. What I think is interesting is if you actually check out the Steam EULA, it's pretty short. Like they don't have a whole lot. It's very clearly understandable to read it. Like it's written to at least my level anyway. They break it all down to what you can do, what you can't do, modding the game, everything is all right there and their liability and so forth. It does have one part that I'm not sure how much I like it. I mean, it doesn't change. I'm going to use it. They do say, we do not sell the game to you. We own the game and brands or content in the game, but you're buying permission to play the game yourself in accordance with the EULA. So as far as that particular line, that is literally every EULA for any piece of generic software. You're paying for a license essentially to rent it. But what I will say is Valve specifically has given me enough goodwill to trust that one of the things they've said in the past is if they ever went away, that they would make the libraries of games that you have purchased available for you to download and continue to play in some way, shape or form. I can believe that because there's games that have been delisted in my Steam library, but I can still download and play. Mm -hmm. They get a benefit of the doubt there because their actions have stated that I can still play them. (laughs) For the most part, they've been a really good community member and the promises they make for the most part they stick to. Do they do everything right? No. Okay, so I'm going to put that caveat because I know there's going to be somebody say, but there was this one time. So yes, they have had their issues. The overall picture of Valve as a company and its interactions with the community, I'd say they're pretty dang good. Yes. For a company that essentially makes everything they do based around selling proprietary software, they do a fantastic job of helping the overall ecosystem. We wouldn't have good graphics drivers without them. We wouldn't have all these gaming specific enhancements that we would have died for just a few years ago. Uh, Nate, you remember more probably than Wendy would. Do you remember the old school before maybe like the 340 drivers for NVIDIA where it was just like, oh, hey, look, screen tearing. Yay. I was actually going to go back further when the Loki installer was the installer for adding yep. games to Linux. And there was the Linux Game Tomb, I think it was called, or Tome, T-U-M-E, where basically whatever games were there would rarely compile it correctly. Yep. Those were the <laughs> ones that worked on Linux and that was pretty much it. Yep. It's one of those, do I feel like I'm giving up privacy to play video games? Yeah, but again, is it really any different than popping up on a web browser. And I'm talking just like a general Firefox install. I'm not talking about the Chrome, which is going to phone home and do a bunch of other crap and nonsense. I'm talking strictly default install Firefox. And I don't think you're really giving more information than you would give on homepage startup for a Firefox. Like once you start installing Lutris and things like the Epic Game Store, and those services might be a little more up in the air because they don't necessarily, what I would say, have the goodwill that Valve for me has developed. At any time you're introducing anything that can't be verified by somebody else in the community that you trust or isn't verifiable by insert company here that's, you know, you trust, there's going to be a potential for mistrust to happen or misuse to happen. Privacy is a catch-22. It really is because at the end of the day, it boils down to trust and what you're willing to potentially have to give up in order to use a service. That's the reality we live in though. And I don't think sometimes the most vocal people in Linux when it comes to privacy live in the realm of reality. Not saying the status quo is necessarily right, and by all means, talk about it, complain about it, be constructive about it, but also don't be hypocritical about it. I think where I cross the line on the whole privacy policy thing, where my stance is, I try and compare it to in real life activities. If I leave my house and I walk into town, for now, very close to town, I expect that I'm going to be monitored to some level. People are going to see me walking because I'm publicly walking downtown. People will see what stores I go into and so forth. And then where I draw the line is if somebody is following me from store to store or following me around town, stalking me, that's to me a violation. If they're just casually seeing me in different places and not tracking me, not like keeping close track of where I'm going and my behaviors, my routine or whatever, as long as they're not doing that, I think that's okay. If one of these big tech types follow me from one website to another, you know, tracking with cookies or whatever, to me, that's where it crosses the line for me personally. I think they're going too far in tracking me. But if I'm on their site, I'm using their services and they're tracking what virtual aisles I'm going down to look at, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Where I draw the line is the stalking. Container tabs in Firefox is something I use for those web services that do stalk you. And I try and keep them under control somewhat. There's only so much you can do. 
even looking through like Steam's privacy policy, it's pretty straightforward. And I don't see anything here that really egregiously jumps out at me. I mean, I get it. There's a certain amount of bits of information that they need to keep as well. And as long as you're not being public about it, I don't trust their chat system any more than any other. So I just assume anything I say in their chat could be put on a billboard in front of my house for all the world to see because it's somebody else's service. How far do I have to go? When I walk in my town, I don't put on a ghillie suit and go from bush to bush and hide because that's just weird. I think there's an amount of traveling on the internet that if you go too far, maybe it's a little bit weird. And I might consider you a little bit weird using a Tor browser all the time. I get it. There's a place for it. Maybe I'm the weirdo here. You don't have to be super, super vigilant. I just don't want people to stalk me. Maybe ghillie suits required. As far as the Tor thing, and that's more to do with just the overall nature of Android, though, being a Google product. Well, that makes sense. I know what you're giving up. Am I going to use something like Chrome on a Google-based OS that already sucks up enough of my information so they can suck up more information by using their browser on the top of it? So for me, it's one less avenue that I can control. Yeah, that makes sense. You are on what could be considered a compromised platform as it is, potentially doing awful things and you don't know it. And unfortunately, the phone I have, I can't root and run. Well, I can probably root, but I definitely know I can't run because it's too niche of a phone. There are different things that I know that additional data is being taken from. And there are other things that I'm not comfortable at all turning over my data or making sure that I'm a little more protected using free Wi-Fi at some business. Yeah, I'm not cool with that. So I'm making sure I have a VPN. I actually like to have the entire house on a VPN. So all of the devices are connected just for that one more anonymized data point as much as possible. So I do use some things that I guess might be considered shady, but none of them are Facebook. (laughs) I even gave up Instagram because I didn't like new things that were coming out, even though on that platform in general, I really liked it. I liked the photo aspect of it, but I was really creeped out by the new user agreement or whatever that was with it in talking about vagueness last week where it's like, hey, yeah, we can turn on your camera or whatever at any time. No, no, you can't. Bye-bye. There are certain things that I just don't use anymore, even though I would like to use them because I'm not comfortable giving up my privacy in those situations. So it's a give and take. And it's definitely one of those things, as you were saying, Matt, that the community can be 100% interested in privacy, but don't say that you are a thousand percent geared for privacy and then go and do something knowing that it's taking like a ton of data like, oh, nobody else should do it, but I can do it. Just understand that it's a give and take for everybody and we all have to decide how much of our privacy we're willing to give up. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the passive manager we use and trust. It's the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords and other vital sensitive information. Bitwarden lets you choose the authentication to access your password manager, such as PIN, master password, and adding phrases or fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. Bitwarden is a password manager that I use and trust because Bitwarden is 100% open source. It has extensive security audits. It gives you the ability to self-host if you so choose. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. It's only $10 for a premium account, which gives you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, and more. Make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the Premium Edition, especially since the Premium Edition starts at only $10 annually. Bitwarden has saved me from getting into a serious jam numerous times. Now, you wouldn't be able to pry it from my cold, dead device. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. All right, Matt, not to dig into your private life, but uh, since this is a podcast, what games are you playing now? Well, ironically, this is stuff I willingly (laughs) decide to share. (laughs) Oh, oh. <laughs> I had made a challenge to not buy any video games all year. Yes, you did make that challenge. That challenge I have now failed. <laughs> well, hey, you made it six and a half months, so congratulations. Six, uh, no, seven and a half, almost eight. Well, how do you want to count it? By the time this comes out, <laughs> seven and a half. Yeah, but that doesn't count when it comes out. I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't matter. By the time other people hear this. By the time everybody else knows, mm, it'll be seven and a half. (laughs) Exactly. See, Wendy gets it. There's a game series that most people would assume I love, but I've always had a, I want to say love-hate, like 
disinterest to interest kind of relationship with, and that's Kingdom Hearts all the way back from the PS2 days. They've had, I believe, 10 games total that have come out between various side stories and different platforms on like the PSP and DS and Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and whatever. I ended up picking up every single one of them. Well, <laughs> there is a all-in-one package. It is every single Kingdom Hearts game currently that has ever been made. I bought it for $20. So 10 games at basically $2 a lot. And that includes the newest one, which is on the PS4. I was making up for every game I haven't bought over the last six, seven and a half months. Yeah, it looks like it. It was literally $2 <laughs> per game. It's always been a series. I've played certain games in it and I've always tried to get into it. There's something about it that I just could never get into for some reason. So I really wanted to actually give it its fair shake and actually play it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to go on the Epic Store and spend $40 for all these different games. It was available from GameStop, Evil, say what you will about them, but it was 20 bucks, so it's really hard to pass up a $2 a game kind of deal like that to me. The link will be in the show notes for the particular PS4 version that is on GameStop's website. As of this recording, it's $20. If you're a Kingdom Hearts fan, if you like Disney, and if you like any Final Fantasy type stuff from Square Enix, it's a mashup of all those crammed into one. Sounds like a super great deal. This actually looks like a really great game. The graphic graphics are cool. Uh, they have Olaf in this one that you've showed me. I see there's Goofy and, Goofy Donald, and Donald Duck, Duck and Mickey. Yep. Uh, they're all there. Yep. Mickey Mouse. Yeah. They're core characters. So obviously Disney's bought into this at some level. Oh, and there's Toy Story. Some dude with interesting hair. A spiky haired hero would be uh, that one's Sora. If it's brown, if it's a different color, then... Yeah, that's where I start getting confused. The overarching storyline is a bit convulted. Let's just put it that way. But it looks fun, though. It's E10+, plus, so everyone that's 10 mm-hmm. and over can play it. There's some dark moments in it, but it's not... Can't be any worse than Disney movies. Have you seen Cinderella? Come on. Have you seen Bambi? <laughs> Finding Nemo? <laughs> yeah. Toy Story 4? Yes. Toy Story 4, is that the one where Andy leaves the toys with the new kid? No, nope. uh, that's 3. That one's pretty dark, too, but 4 has got a dark part in it, too. So, I mean, it can't be any worse than that. Well, you know, life can be dark. It's the it's the, the shiny things around it. With my tenacity of trying to not buy video games this year, Wendy, you've been tenaciously testing some certain things out. What has that been, though? Yes, thank you for all those wonderful dad jokes or not. After our conversation <laughs> last week, I really started diving more into what are some of the other forks that are out there. And there was a thread running on the discourse forum. I'll link to that below. One of the videos in there included several different Audacity forks that are in there. And the one that I actually tried out this week is called Tenacity. Originally, it was on the GitHub repositories with no name, just kind of a space filler and Tenacity is what they've decided to call this fork of Audacity. Actually, I really like it. It's close enough that if you've been anywhere around the project Audacity, that it'll at least bring that thought to mind, though the name of it really has nothing to do with the actual application itself. I know that's been a complaint across the community multiple times about how the application name doesn't sound anything like what it's for, which we've got those all over the place, like Lollipop or Gimp or all of those, you know, that's nothing new. But I actually kind of found this name a little funny. I used this one to edit the last episode, 65, of DLN Extend. And for the most part, you know, it's a straight up fork. Nothing was really different until I got to the end. I don't know if this is something they're working on or not, but one of the plugins that I use and it's the last step in editing the show was completely and totally gone. And it was one of those steps that I can't not use at this point. So what are the steps that I do when I'm going through and editing the show? Of course, as you're doing your basic edits and stuff, there's a little bit of noise reduction as you're going through. That happens anywhere during that process. Then once all the editing is fully done, you're down to the three vocal tracks and you need to wrap up cleaning everything up. So then I will go to the filter curve. And in the past, I've actually used a filter curve where it's a hundred hertz drop off. And basically that helps get rid of some of that weird low end background noise that's going on. Definitely makes everything sound just a little bit crisper. Now I will be actually using some filter curves that have been designed to help make the voice sound a little more natural. So this one will be using those new filter curves. So let me know what you think. Do you like the new filter curves or not? After that, we go compressor. 
then loudness normalization, and the very last step, usually because after normalization, there can be some peaking. And I shared a picture of this in another thread, or maybe it's even in that same thread on the discourse forms of what it looks like, what our audio looks like before I have run this limiter. And what does the limiter do? It takes everything and you can have hard or soft. I typically use soft and it brings it down to a certain level. So you're not going above a certain point. And this would be on that monitor bar across the top. So our music usually hits about a negative six and I cap all of our voices off about the same place. So there's no peaking, there's no blowouts on that side. If there's any cracking or stuff going on, that's things that happened at the mic level and just can't be changed. That makes everything a little more consistent. And I'd reached the point that I was ready to apply the limiter and went crap and didn't know where it was to get it, you know, reinstalled because it was saying in the add and remove plugins that it was there. I would enable everything. And of course, there wasn't the separate file source for it to use it. I had installed OpenSUSE Leap on a second drive. I jump over to that drive, installed regular Audacity onto it, the one from the OpenSUSE repos, went ahead, applied the limiter, wrapped up the show so it could go out as normal. But now Tenacity is not only in the GitHub repos, which when I installed it the first time, I actually installed it from GitHub itself. It is now available in the AUR. I know they are working really hard to start getting it packaged and out to different distributions to be in their repos. That takes time. Of course, it really takes time to get all of that done. But now that they have a name, they now have a logo, it'll be a lot easier to start getting some of that stuff packaged out. I am curious, now that I found it in the AUR this morning, to go ahead and get that version installed and see if those additional plugins are available or not and just kind of play with it and see what happens. It's a step that I can't go without at this point, and I don't know how to mitigate that unless none of us were peaking at the time. So we'll see how it goes. I really enjoyed using it. I would love to see at least one of the forks that's out there actually take hold and be widely used by the community and really supported. So this is the one I'm using at the moment so far, except for the one plugin that I didn't have. It ran just like normal. Everything was the same as though I was using Audacity at this point, early period in the forking. And I'd like to see where it goes from here. I've been really tempted and compelled to try and get a hold of the team. I can't do any of the coding for this, but I would love to see how I could help out in other ways to get this off the ground a little bit faster. Is it from the AUR you installed Tenacity or what, what was the source for? When I installed it originally, I installed it directly from GitHub. Oh, okay. And now... I don't have to do that. I can install it from the AUR and hopefully pretty soon it will be in other repos as well. I know as one of their things to do, their checklist was to get in touch with all of the distributions and work on packaging to get it in distro repos. Well, that's very cool. I know there's a Tenacity Snap or Flatpak. I checked on that. To me, it doesn't hurt to have it out there. It's not going to hurt anybody. It'd be good to have more people working on it, more eyes on it. I mean, if it's two different groups of people working on it, may have different ideas. They might cross pollinate eventually too. I don't see it as a bad thing. I'm not worried about Audacity, but I'd like to see that there are at least some hedges of sorts. Yeah, absolutely. I know there are some people that said, hey, if you're pulling it from the repo, your repository could probably go through and turn off some of these phoning home aspects of it or whatever. And it's one of those things where, especially going back to the main topic of today, I have no desire to be turning over data for a local program that's an audio editor. I'm just not going there. So while that version of Audacity isn't out yet, I've already started looking for alternatives. There was actually another alternative that came up on the discourse form, and I can't remember what it's called, but I went ahead and installed that one too, and it looks like a pretty powerful editor, but it's really more geared toward music creation and music recording. So I don't know if it would have the tools to edit a podcast in the way that I would like to get it out or that other people would be comfortable using for that type of production. Well, the difficulty is you have this workflow already established with Audacity and to just learn something brand new that's totally different, that has different filters and different effects and so forth, that can be a little bit overwhelming. It can be a little overwhelming. That's why people are slow to change. I was looking for classes on this other one and I will share a link to that in the description since I can't remember the name of it right now. But everything that I was finding 
even on the tutorial side, was all geared towards music, all of it. And I don't want a tutorial that's geared towards music. I don't create music. I won't be using it for music. And if I can find one that is geared toward using this application for podcast production, then I'd be 100% on the bandwagon. But I don't want to spend hours of time sorting through trying to pick out what's relevant to me. I have four kids. I don't have time for that. Right. I'm interested to see how this uh, progresses for you. Hopefully it all works out well. Now it's time to jump back into the PS4. Matt had some PS4 games for us, and it sounds like you're interested in playing the PS4 too. Well, Matt, I decided that since the PS5 is out, it was time to get a PS4. And uh, I went to a local store to get some games for it, and I wasn't really inspired by anything. But there was Star Wars Battlefront 2. It seems like it's fun to play. It's not as fun as like Lego Star Wars. It's a well done game. The graphics are great. It's very, I think the term that the kids use these days, immersive. Though I didn't really play it much as most of my 10 year old who's showing me how to play it, which I kind of had that old feeling moment there for a little bit. Now, you just shared a great game, which is why I don't want to go too far into that, The Kingdom of Hearts. That looks like that'd be fun for me to play. Do you have any other game recommendations for somebody who just got a PS4 and thinks all the games look stupid? (laughs) For somebody who thinks all the games look stupid. Everything that I saw looks stupid. I mean, like, I'm sorry, this might get my nerd card revoked, but like anything that's Call of Duty-esque to me is dumb. So I don't want a game like that. I want a game that's actually fun and enjoyable to play. That's a little bit lighthearted, you know, that doesn't involve... First person shooters are fine, but they're kind of old. Yes, I have two games that I can recommend for you. I don't know what the current cost is. The first one is a launch title, but the second one came out later in the system's life. So you have Knack, K-N-A-C-K. It's a series. There's Knack 1 and Knack 2. Those are more lighthearted type games as far as like their gameplay and that kind of stuff. So those might be something you might enjoy. There's almost like a Lego vibe to it. Okay, now you're speaking my language, Lego vibe. Lighthearted games are really hard to determine because that's kind of a subjective take on what you view as lighthearted. Sure, I get that. Just something that isn't a violence-based. You know, I don't mind fighting, but cartoony violence, totally cool with that. Blood and gore violence, not really into that. A knack would definitely be more up your alley then. It's more cartoony violence. I believe they came out with a little big planet as well for the, the PS4. So okay. that would be another one. I like the PS3 version, as I misspelled little. Yeah, it was Little Big Planet 3 for the PS4. It would be another one you'd probably like. Those are some quick recommendations off the top of my head that I have for you. I mean, I can make some other recommendations, but that's going to have to be more than, hey, video game recommendation now. Right. No, I totally get it. I did kind of put you on the spot. And you did provide a great recommendation unwittingly to me in the beginning. So I do appreciate that. I mean, 20 bucks is not bad for a game, especially what has 10 games in it or something like that. Kingdom Hearts runs across, I believe, PS2, PSP, certain DS it ran the gambit as far as like console like where they went to and stuff so there's a bunch of different styles of types of games that are on those that particular package i would check it out if you're interested in that like whimsical kind of feel because that's definitely got a feel for it i like whimsy whimsy's good well hey i appreciate that not that i would ever make recommendations or send people games right wendy No, never. Not at all. I haven't got that random message from you that says, hey, guess what? Here's this game that I think your kids would like. Mm, Never. Go back to you are the Doctor Strange of gaming on the DLN network. I do appreciate the uh, recommendations. I will be uh, looking at these as I have the time. Not real urgency right now, you know, because the whole transitionary period that's going on right now. Next week, I think be settled out. Knock on wood. Yeah, I got a good start here. I did forget. You might like the Ratchet and Clank games too, but I'm not sure where their humor. The what? Ratchet and Clank. The problem is I'm not sure where their context lies as far as their uh, suitability for younger audiences. Let's put it that way. I get you. Well, I will look it up and we'll find out. We'd like to continue this discussion with you on Telegram, in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for information on how to connect to the social channels and all of our shows and creators at destinationlinux.network. For more information on me, you can go to cubiclenate.com. Links to my regular written blatherings podcast and YouTube channel can be found there, albeit a bit light. You can find my random ramblings and random game recommendations on Twitter at MattDLN. You can find me on Macedon at WendyDLN at Macedon.online. Be sure to check out the DLN merch store. Grab yourself some awesome DLN Extend swag along with stuff from across the network. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone. So...
show how many bad mats are going to be in this episode. Anyone take bets? 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 There's one there. It went at about 19 minutes and 40 seconds. So better write that one down. I don't know how to transition out of that one. Thanks, Nate. Throw you in a wet paper bag that you can't break out of. <laughs> what can I say? More like you put my face in a Ziploc bag. And <laughs> oh, no. Those are too expensive. I wouldn't spend that kind of money on you, Matt. Don't worry, Nate. I would only spend it to the 10 cents for a nine, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> if that's Ouch. not dark. <laughs> well, wow. Kind of a dark one. I'm just saying. <laughs> Wendy's like, that one don't sound real quick. <laughs> Well, then. Wendy, would you expect anything less from me? No. <laughs> yes. I always expect less from you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> now that we've totally gotten derailed from that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Sweet. good luck transitioning to that one to Wendy. Whew. We survived. And my kids were quiet. Cool beans. Or ended up being quiet. Ha, 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 ha.